بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. The first question is why is magic haram? That means what is the reason behind its tahrim? What is the reason behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, making it something forbidden uh, for us to engage in? First of all, there's a difference of opinion uh, inside the family of Islam as to what magic is exactly. As Sunnis, we believe that magic is something that is, is real. It can actually, uh, it, it actually has an effect. The Mu'tazilites, which were a fringe or a, a, a non-orthodox uh, school of theology, which really no longer exists, they believe that it was not necessarily real, but it's something that, that appears to be, its effects appear to be real, but that, that effect that you, that, that you see is not actually real. And it goes back to a difference of tafsir of some of the verses dealing with magic, particularly in the story of Moses salam. But as Sunnis, we believe that it's real. Magic actually exists and, and it can have effect, but it's actually very weak. In the case that shaitan cannot da'if, that the powers and the ability and the machinations rather, is a better translation, the machinations of shaitan are weak. So our belief is, yes, it is. it does exist, it can happen, but its effects are weak. So why is it haram for us to deal with it? Because when Allah Ta'ala describes magic in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, When Allah Ta'ala talks about Harut and Marut and learning magic, etc. in the Quran and the, the story of Sidna Sulaiman, He says that they learn what harms them and what harms other people, not what benefits them. So the reason why magic is haram, it's haram to engage in it, is because it is something that its ultimate goal is to harm. It, it causes harm. You know, no one's going to do magic for something good to happen. It's not like a movie. You know, when people practice magic, or, or sometimes we translate it as black magic, they do it with the intention of, of harming uh, someone. And obviously, that's haram. La darar wa la dirar. There's no harming or reciprocating harm, as the Prophet the says. In Wait. addition. People that engage in magic, they end up focusing or they end up relying on other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for us, our reminder constantly is la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, that there is no power or ability except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are certain foods haram? Certain foods are haram due to Allah's wisdom. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed that certain things be haram. There's not necessarily a rational explanation why we don't eat pork or why we don't eat the dog or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, other than to remind us that there is a spiritual link between what we eat and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's as if Allah ta'ala is telling us that there is something divine right now, behind the issue of food. That we are meant to eat halal and tayyibah, that we are meant to eat food that is halal, it's, it's legally permissible, but it's also tayyib, but it's also good. And then in many instances, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi taught us that what we eat, what we consume, what we drink, what we wear affects us, our heart, affects our heart, affects our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Uh, like in the hadith where the man is traveling and he extends his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb. Uh, he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So outwardly, you know, he's, he's a traveler. He's in need. He's, he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, haram, 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 But rather this person's food is haram. Their drink is haram. Their clothes are haram. They are nourished by the haram. How is it that Allah Ta'ala will accept from this person? So in that hadith and in other hadiths, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is telling us what we eat, what we consume affects our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So when we find that kind of pattern, then we are reminded that it's, it is out of Allah's wisdom. It's something that is, is revealed from the divine and that there's no necessarily, there's not necessarily a rational explanation. Uh, and sometimes that's just the answer. In other words, uh, it doesn't mean that there's no answer. I'm trying to impress upon us that that is the answer. We call this in, in the study of, of Usul al-Fiqh, we, call, we say that the reason is ta'abudi. The reason is that we do it out of worship, meaning that, that there's no reason 
there's no rational reason why, but rather we do it out of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To remind us that this is a religion, that this is a religious tradition. This is not some kind of philosophical or rational science. Why is smoking haram? Well, the issue of smoking is something that has progressed legally in Islamic history because when it first appeared, it was something new and, and there were you know, a whole host of different opinions. You know, people said that it was haram, people said that it was makruh, people said that it was mubah. Uh, some you know, minor people even said it was, it was uh, encouraged, uh, mustahab. But as the harm of smoking became more established, the people, the ulama that, that opine that it is haram, and that's today the majority of ulama, they say that it is haram because of its yeah, established yeah, harm. Yeah. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, la darar wa la dirar. There is no harming and there is no reciprocating harm. I'm sorry, just somebody's mic is on. So I feel like I'm gonna yell over it. Um, if, if everyone can just turn off the mic, I'm gonna see if I can find that person. Okay, I think it's gone. Just a reminder for everyone to keep, make sure that their mic is, is off. Oh, I don't have the ability to mute. Uh, okay, anyway. So the majority of people today, the majority of fuqaha, the majority of muftis today, they say that smoking is haram because it's, its harm is established. Uh, it's harm health-wise, etc. There is a minority of people that say it's it's disliked, uh, it's makruh, simply because the harm is is different. You know, a, a, a 15-year-old smoking is not like a you know 80-year-old COVID patient smoking. I mean, the effect, the harm on each person will be will be different. But the majority of people they say that it is haram uh, because of its harm, uh, its harm health-wise, which is essentially an established scientific fact. What if we are following the wrong religion? <laughs> so this is a bigger question. I'm just gonna, I wanna mark what I've done so I don't repeat. How do, another way of phrasing this is how do we know we are right? Or how do we know, or how have we come to know what we know? And believe it or not, this was a question that the early Muslims asked themselves. They ask themselves, how do we know that what we have is the Qur'an? And how do we know that what we have is the Sunnah or the Hadith of the Prophet And because of this question, there is a, uh, a huge movement, intellectual, uh, scholarly movement, you know, from the time of the Sahaba till our time for, for tawthiq, for verification. And Islam is very concerned and very obsessed with this issue of verifying. How do we verify that we have the, the Qur'an that we have is the Qur'an? How do we verify that the hadith we have is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ? And in, through a very sophisticated system of verification and analyzing chains of transmission and uh, uh, establishing that all of the links in the chain of transmission that these people are actually real and they actually met and they had good memories and they were known members of society, the ulama uh, from the earliest generation established without any doubt uh, whatsoever that the Qur'an that we have is the Qur'an and then the sunnah that we have is the sunnah is the sayings and the acts and the, and the actions of the Prophet And because of that, we have a huge degree of confidence that what we have is real. In other words, that there is no human agency that could have protected the Qur'an. Allah Ta'ala says, inna We alone preserve the Qur'an and we alone uh, will protect it. So it's not through human agency that this happened, but the effort of verification simply allowed us to see how this verse has played out. And there's nothing that has been protected uh, you know, in human history like, like the Qur'an. There is, no, there is no divine book or revealed book or revealed tradition that has that kind of protection, that has no discrepancy or no one's ever found a missing juz, a missing surah, a missing verse, etc. Same with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's how we verify what we have. And the early Muslims, when they ask that question, well, how do we know that this is really our, our, you know, our religion? 
it was that they answered it by engaging in that uh, you know, system of verification. But if the person is asking the question, how do we know that our religion is right? Or how do we know, what if we are following the wrong religion is, is how the question came to me. This also might have to do with faith, Iman. And Iman is something that, that comes into the heart. I can't make that for you. But each person has to be on their own journey to arrive at that certainty, arrive at that belief. Qanat al-Arab wa when the Arab tribes first became Muslim, Allah says in the Quran, the Arab tribe said that we believe. Allah Ta'ala responds and says, But don't say you have believed, but rather say you have become Muslim. You have entered into Islam because faith has not entered into your, your heart yet. The reason we believe that there's no compulsion in religion, la ikraha fi din, is that faith is something that each person has to arrive at and has to make the effort to arrive at. I can give you, I can try to answer some of the questions like we do in this forum every month. But at the end of the day, the, the point of these questions is not to make you believe. The point of these questions is to answer these questions and to shed light on them and to share the as much as I can of the scholarly tradition with you so that you can understand the, um, the, the deep thinking and, and great extent that the, the people before us uh, had and, and gave towards understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah. But still, at the end of the day, belief is something that it comes down to you individually to arrive at that, at, at that certainty. For me, the way I look at this question is, as, as I began with the, with the answer, is I look at how the early Muslims answer that question for themselves, that they saw the revelation in front of them, that they, were, they verified it, that they maintained it and that they found it to that, that, that preservation to last, you know, through the ages. I mean, we still have the Quran, alhamdulillah, we still have the Sunnah. So think, of, think about that. What are the methods that can help us pray on time and avoid feeling tired or lazy and postpone it? Well, one tactic is that if people are having difficulty with the prayer, is that they can combine Dhuhr and Asr prayer in either time of Dhuhr. So either when Dhuhr time comes in, you pray four rakahs of Dhuhr, and then you stand and you pray four rakahs of Asr, or you delay, and when Asr time comes in, you pray the four of Dhuhr and the four of Asr, and the same with Maghrib and Aisha. So when you add Fajr to that, you are essentially praying the five prayers in three times during the day. So for people that are, are having difficulty, and because we are in the West, that this is a dispensation that we have, and then this comes from the uh, from the, this is the Shafi position of the permissibility of combining the prayers uh, without reason of, of illness or, or travel or inclement weather, which are the normal uh, circumstances for combining the prayers. And then this way, the prayer becomes easier. It becomes an easier target. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you should have a, some kind of a then app on your phone and you should you know have it ring for you when the prayer time comes in in other words a way to to reinforce that that you know or to help have that reminder that okay now is the time to pray you want to also think about scheduling it okay i'm going to pray my duhras combination at this time you know and put it in your calendar and remind yourself maybe you put it in your phone maybe you remind yourself the other thing is to you know, maybe those are more like strategies and tactics. But the other thing to think about is think about why you're praying and why that's important. And the implications of not praying, and the implications of not praying, you know, God forbid, are, are very severe. That this is considered a major sin. That the first thing that we will be asked about Yom Al-Qiyamah is our prayer. If our prayer is sound, inshallah, all of our other deeds will be sound. If our prayer is in trouble, then we'll, we'll be in trouble. You know, may Allah Ta'ala protect us. So to think about the implications of that in the hereafter and to, to remind yourself that this life that we have is very limited. You know, we're only going to live here an X amount of years. Um, and then we're going to be asked about, about what we have uh, done. We're going to be asked about what we have been given. Uh, and Allah Ta'ala asks very little of us in return for all of the immense gifts and bounties that he has, has given us. So you have to think about those other meanings and you have to to move beyond just the here and now and the laziness and think, okay, this is a great, you know, a great thing that I must do. Uh, and it has great reward or great punishment 
associated with its act or, or non-act. And therefore, inshallah, that will help push you forward to pray. Is it safer or better to raise our teenage girls in Muslim countries than the US, especially with no family here? That's not a, a clear cut situation because everybody's situation is different. I know many people in the Muslim world, uh, unfortunately, who have lost or are losing their faith. Just like I know many people in the West that you know, have lost or are losing their faith. So it's not, it's not a, uh, there's no one place that's better or safer than the other as a place, but rather it's each person's circumstance. The person in the question, they say that they, they have no family. So therefore, we need to make sure that we have a community. And as a matter of fact, for people that are from a Muslim majority country and a Muslim majority family, oftentimes that extended family is not necessarily a help. Sorry. Sometimes that extended family is not a help in these matters. And it could be more of a harm. So again, it's, it depends on everybody's simple dynamic. But what's important is that you surround yourself with some kind of community, some kind of a support group that will support the values and the ethics that you believe in, which is why our community, you know, is 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 paramount. It's so important because our community is our family. Uh, the fact that we, you know, for one almost one whole year for one whole year we've been meeting like this uh, consistently. I mean, look how many people right now there are. Sixty people signed in. Right, I assume there's at least two to three people on each, uh, you know, each sign in. You know, so there are several hundred people about one whole year we've been doing this. Why have we been doing this? Because it's important that we stay connected. It's important that we, we are a family. We are all one family. And that's what's important is having that community. Uh, it's not about being here or there. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, think about all of the prophets, you know, how they were sent. They were sent, you know, to like no man's land, right? The, the prophets were sent to people that were troubled, that people that didn't believe that people, but they were prophets, you know, they were protected. They were the community. Uh, think about the Sahaba after the passing of the prophet, والسلام, how they sort of left Arabia, you know, many went east to, to Persia, many went west, you know, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Uh, radiallahu anhu was buried in, in Istanbul in the, in the European part. You know, he's a Sahaba. You know, th these people were very far from home, uh, but they carried that mission and they carried that connection with them. So it's not about location. It's about your state, your spiritual state. And what will help your spiritual state is your suhba, is your community, is the companionship that you keep. Um, for some people, it might be better that they, they take their family uh, you know, back to their home country uh, for some people, that will be the, the, the biggest mistake. So I don't want people to think about, oh, you know, being in the West, that's necessarily bad. No, that's not the case. We enjoy many, many freedoms and many, many luxuries and many, many opportunities Islamically in the West that, we, that do not exist in many parts of the Muslim majority country. So it's the community. It's having that support group, that community, and having the people in the community that can help guide the community spiritually and religiously and, uh, and can help answer people's questions. And, and, you know, especially when there are difficult issues, that's what matters. If you have that, inshallah, then you have what you need. Imam al-Mawardi, who is a very famous Qadi of the Shafi'i Madhab, uh, you know, he's very famous for writing Al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyya, the, the rules of, of govern, Islamic governorship. But he's also, you know, he has a huge uh, uh, literature, a huge body of, of, of work in the Shafi, in, in fiqh. He said that if you have uh, your own community, and if you have your, you know, you can pray your five prayers, and you can, uh, you have access to halal food, and you can marry according to the sharia, and you can uh, bury your dead, and, you know, if you have those basic things, then that for you is Dar al-Islam even if that is in a non-Muslim land. And I remember reading that, you know, um, you know I, I think I came across that quote as a, as a graduate student, and that, that was a huge uh, paradigm shift for me to, 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 to realize, you know, what he's saying, what I've just answered is essentially what he was saying, which is that if you have the basic things that you need to practice your Islam, that's your abode of Islam, that's what you need. Uh, sometimes you don't have that in a Muslim majority country. Sometimes you don't have that in a, in a, as a minority and vice versa. So it's not about 
East versus West, but it's about having that infrastructure. I have a place where I can pray. I have a pr place where I can do, do Ramadan as a community. You know, I have access to Juma. I have access to someone who can answer my questions. There are other families that, that want the same things that I want. So therefore that our, our children can grow up uh, in that environment together, et cetera. That's, that's what we're after, inshallah. How can we help our teens or encourage them to pray the five daily prayers? I mean, if somebody has, you know, is entering into their teenage years not praying, uh, it, unfortunately, that's going to be an uphill uh, battle. And that's why prayer is so important that we teach our children at the youngest age possible. First of all, that they see us praying, uh, that we pray together at, in the house, uh, and that they learn from a very young age that this is a, an essential part of their existence. This is not like a, a weird thing or an extra thing, or we pray you know, only on Friday or only on the weekends, but we pray every day. And again, the, the, the issue of being able to combine your prayers is something that will help tremendously, you know, especially kids that are going to school whether it be in wintertime or in summertime when we, you know, in the spring when we change the clock forward, the day is longer or the day is shorter. This issue of combining the prayers will save a lot of, a lot of trouble uh, of having to figure out how to pray at school and you can delay and pray at home and, and, and things like that. If, if you haven't been doing that and your kids, you know, you find your kids are 14, 15, 16 and not praying, you know, it's very hard to get them to, to just to start out, you know, for no reason. So, Unfortunately, that's not, you know, there's not much you're going to be able to do. Uh, the, the meta issue here is having to impress upon them the importance of that connection, that their day-to-day -day life, if it's devoid of that connection, of that spiritual connection, uh, then it is going to slowly be devoid of that type of protection. Uh, and because most teenagers don't think like that, that might be lost upon them. But you have to just get them to, to be responsible for their own lives and that, that this is important, that this is an important part. You know, live your life, do, your, you know, do what you want to do, hang out with your friends, have a good time, all that kind of stuff. But you have to have that kind of connection. There has to be that kind of, of balance. You have to find a way to communicate that, that message to, to, those, uh, to your children. But as I said, you need to do this the earlier, the better, and not to wait. And this is a reminder for all of us that we need to be you know, praying at home and praying with our children and, and our families. Were our prophets, Sassam's parents, grandparents, and uncle the believers of Abrahamic monotheism? I mean to ask, what was their religion? Yeah, all of the parents all of the parents and grandparents, etc., of the Prophet ﷺ, going all the way back to the beginning of creation, they were all monotheists. This is the, one of the meanings of the verse, sajidin, and that we have caused you to transfer from one pious person, a sajid, the person that makes sujood, from one pious person to the next pious person. So this is the, the, the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that all of the uh, family, the, the parents, the direct parents, uh, Sayyidah Abdullah and Sayyidah Amina, uh, salam, and all, going all the way back, these are all people that were saved. As for the uncle of the Prophet, salam, there's a difference of opinion uh, whether he was saved, you know, whether he said the kalima, well, one of the uncles, whether he uh, said the kalima uh, or not. And we follow the opinion that he said the kalima out of our love for the Prophet ﷺ because there's no you know, fiqhi issue based on that. It's just, a, it's just a belief. But yes, they were all monotheists. How could we be good and dutiful to our parents when they are not with us in this country? You know, connect with them, call them, ask about them. Uh, if they need something, the, provide it for them. If, you know, if it's a remittance that you're sending back or if it's a service that you help them uh, procure, you know, now with technology, we're able to, to be in touch with them, ask about them. Uh, you know, one of the greatest challenges in, in older age, you know, people that are older is loneliness. Um, uh, so we have to be dutiful to our parents, uh, whether they are alive or not. This is something that is, that is upon us until the, you know, until the day we die. And th that's important that we remember that, you know, 
we're not an out of sight, out of mind people. Just because my parents are not here doesn't mean that I, I don't owe them something or I don't have to ask about them. No, we have to ask about them. We have to check in on them. Uh, that's very, very important. So check in, pick up the phone or send a message, ask, call. I remember when we were younger, it's just a memory that just popped into my head, you know, before all of this technology, uh, my mom used to, we had like a, a tape recorder that could record. So we put like a blank cassette tape in the tape recorder and she would record me and my brother, you know, would like read like Surah Al-Fatiha or then we would like in, in our broken Arabic, we would say, oh, you know, no, no, grandma, we miss you. Or like I, I learned a new piece on the piano. So I would play the piece. And so we would, my mom over the weeks would just make like these little audio clips on this cassette tape uh, for my grandma which, you know, her mother, Allah Rahma, Allah have mercy on her. And when she would go or, you know, somebody from, you know, our family or friends would visit uh, Cairo, they would take that tape with, with, with them. So can you imagine my, my grandma's, uh, you know, I never thought about this, but can you imagine her reaction, you know, sitting there for like an hour, listening to this weird audio mix of her grandkids uh, must have brought her tremendous uh, joy. So, you know, if, you have to find a way to stay in the picture. You have to find a way to communicate. You have to find a way to ask, ask about. Now we, can, we have so, it's so easy for us to do that now with, with, the, with technology. So this is one of the benefits of that. What is the ruling of shaking hands between men and women? So shaking hands between men and women was not something, or was not some, it was not something that was co a common practice uh, at the time of the Salaf. This is a, a, new, uh, a new thing. Uh, and a very Western, a Western thing. Now, the way that our legal system works is that whenever there is something that deals with men and women, the automatic answer is that it is haram unless there is something that proves otherwise. This is an usuli principle, al aslu fi tabdiya at tahrim. That if there's anything, if, if anyone were to ask a question that deals with a man and a woman, the automatic answer is that it's going to be haram, unless there's a text that proves otherwise, which is the opposite of um, new things. All new things are accepted until there is a text or until there's something that is established that makes it, uh, uh, that would make it haram. So this is a, uh, one of the rules of Islamic law. So for many, for, for, for a long time, or if you ask many people, they'll say, oh, you know, men and women shaking hands is haram. Uh, why? It's because of this, this rule. But is there a prohibition? Is there a text? Is there an actual hadith that is, that is authenticated that can be used as a proof text? The muhaqqiqun, those who, who investigated this issue, found that there is no hadith that is sound. There are hadith that are, that are there. Uh, that people use to, to talk about, you know, it's impermissible for a man to touch a woman, etc. And then when the ulama of hadith investigated those hadith, they found them to be too weak to rely on for a ruling. So the position that I follow is that it is not haram for a man uh, to shake hands with a woman. However, I do acknowledge that at times it would be inappropriate. Uh, it, it would be inappropriate like in the mosque, you know, or in a, in a gathering, at, you know, at our masjid. It's just not something that we do. It's not something that is part of the culture of, of Islam. Um, again, it's not a haram and halal thing. It's just not the way we, I mean, definitely now with COVID and stuff like that, we, we're going back to no one wants to shake anyone's hands. But, you know, when you're out in your uh, normal life or in a family gathering or in a work gathering and there's a shaking hands, there's nothing, there's nothing haram with that. Uh, for the people that, you know, that have investigated, these are reliable ulama. Uh, I know, like, for me, I, I remember reading Mah Sheikh Muhammad Zakir Din Ibrahim, radiallahu uh, who's a famous uh, Sheikh, uh, Azhari Sheikh, who died in the, the 90s, the 1990s. And, you know, he argued, you know, the same argument that I'm giving, he, you know, he's the one that put this argument together, one of the people I know that put the argument together and looked into the proof text. Allahu a'lam. Is making dua al qunut only permissible during Salat al Fajr? No, you can make dua al qunut in any prayer if there's a nazada, if there's a problem or a, or a crisis. Which would, it would be the dua in the last uh, raka of the prayer. How to overcome, get rid of panic attacks during flights or while driving? Well, 
if this is a spiritual problem, then you should uh, learn and memorize the dua of, uh, of travel, you know, subhanallah, sakhar, lana hadha, wa ma'kun lahum muqrinin, etc., till the end of it, and see if that helps and see if that comforts you. Uh, if, the, if that continues, and this is not a spiritual problem, but this is something that you need to see a healthcare f- a professional or physician uh, to help with the anxiety because there might be a chemical imbalance. So not all of these things are, you know, just say this dua and everything is going to be fine. Sometimes you need to go to the, to the physician. How to correct my husband while praying if he missed something. So the woman, when her hands are together like this, she, she claps like this to indicate that something is wrong. Being a female, I miss a few days of each Ramadan. I try my best to make up for the missing days, but not always being successful. What are my obligations and my options? There's a difference of opinions in the different schools of how to deal with this. The opinion that we give uh, is that you have to make up your prayer. uh, Sorry, you have to make up your fasting uh, sometime. Even if you don't make up all of the days of Ramadan before the next Ramadan, you just have to tally how many days you have. And if you are physically able to fast, you need to fast those, those days. So make a plan for yourself of how to fast the days, whether you're fasting Mondays and Thursdays, whether you're fasting a lot in the winter because the days are short, like now, you know, now's a great time to, to make up missed fasts because the days are short. And we have another about month, uh, a little, what is today? We have, a, we have a month and a half, about a month and a half until we change the clock uh, forward. So you have time you know, in the short days. So you have to make up the, the fasts, inshallah. Why do men get double while women half when they inherit property from parents? So that is, that is not entirely true the way that the statement is, is uh, phrased. There are some circumstances in which men inherit more than women. There are circumstances in which men and women inherit the same. There are circumstances in which women inher- inherit more than men, and there are circumstances in which women inherit more than men. And if you look at the, uh, the book that I translated, uh, responding from the tradition, there's a fatwa, I believe it's fatwa number nine that I translated that uh, enumerates all of those cases, all of those scenarios. However, in the cases, in the instances in which a brother would inherit twice his sister, you have to understand that there is a twin to that scenario, which is that that sister will always, or any woman in in the scheme that we're talking about, in the inheritance scheme, will always fall under another man's financial obligation. If a woman inherits, let's say I have a sister and I inherit two shares to my sister's one share, either my sister is my financial responsibility because she's single and she, she lost her parents, or she's married and and her husband, uh, she falls under his financial responsibility. So the share that she takes is 100% hers. She has no obligation to use it or to spend it. Whereas a man has a will always have a financial obligation, uh, whether it be on their spouse or whether it be on their children or whether it be to their parents, etc. So people forget that, and that's one of the meanings of uh, when Allah says that men have a degree over women, it's a degree of responsibility. One of those responsibilities is financial. And that's also spelled out in the Quran. I mean, that, that's a verse. So I don't want people to forget that. It's not just about why do I inherit half or more or less. It's about inheritance. It's about who is closest to the deceased and keeping in mind financial responsibilities and obligations. Well, I guess this is part of that question. If this is Islamic law, will it apply in the U.S. if a person dies without a will? Well, what happens if you die in America without a will, which is not recommended at all? I do not recommend. I, you, everyone has to have a will. I mean, it's not. You, you really need to make that effort. There is a. I believe it's a state matter that there is a distribution of wealth according to certain fractions and percent. I remember I looked into it once. Uh, that's probably based on you know English or common law or something like that. Uh, your your wealth will be distributed that way. So it's it's not advisable that that uh, anybody. Uh, you, you need to take that seriously. Everyone should have a will, and all of that stuff should be spelled out. 
because the state will come in, both the state and the federal government, and your wealth will be distributed according to those laws, whether you like it or not. If one's husband does not provide the mahr to the bride from the beginning of the marriage, are the nuptials still legitimate? I have been married for six years, but have not been given any mahar, instead have been provided shelter and food. So the mahar is not a condition for the marriage contract to be valid. So it is an obligation that stems from the marriage contract. So yes, the marriage is valid, of course, but the mahar is obligatory for the man to pay for the woman. In this circumstance, uh, she is due what we call mahar al-mithl, the mahar of, the, of a woman who is similar to her, uh, whether her sisters or her friends or people of that social class or whatever, you know, whatever her cousins, uh, whatever is appropriate, uh, whatever is established that somebody like her received, he has to, to pay. So this is something that is an obligation that the man has to pay to the woman, uh, even if it's after the marriage contract. The shelter and food, that's an obligation. Again, like we just said in the previous question, you know, men have a degree over women. I, I am obligated to, to provide food and shelter for my wife. This is, the mahar is something that is beyond that. It's like a financial gift to the woman. So I can't say, oh, I provide you food and shelter. I don't have to pay the mahar. It doesn't work like that. If a man is infertile and his wife is fertile, they cannot have children through fertility services. Can the wife take a divorce on these grounds as she does not want to be left childless in her marriage? Sure, she has the right to ask for a divorce. There's nothing wrong with that in that situation. Low alam. Um, if he does not provide for the wife due to illness and expects the wife to earn, is this considered a form of abuse on her or just circumstances? If he steals from his wife, what are the avenues for grievances in the U.S.? So a husband and wife are married. Uh, something, you know, man, the man loses his job or, or is sick and can't work. There's nothing wrong with the woman stepping in uh, to, to help. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so it is a circumstance, you know, qaddar Allahu ma sha'fa'al. Now the men stealing from the wife, that's, 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 another, that's another story altogether. That's obviously not permissible. And if the man is, is just like not working because he doesn't want to work uh, and his illness is gone and all of that kind of stuff is taken care of, but he's still like not wanting to work, you know, she can ask for a divorce. Uh, that would be grounds for a divorce because he's not living up to his obligations. As far as theft, it depends, you know, what the, how the finances are, you know, because you, you say the questioner asked, what are the recourses for that in the U.S.? It depends. Is this a joint account? Is it not a joint account? All of that stuff would impact how we would deal with that. If it's a joint account, there's very little you can do, I think, because that's considered a joint tenants by the entirety type of property in, in U.S. law. But if it's your account only and not his account and he steals from it, then, you know, you, there are probably legal steps that you can take, but you would have to consult a lawyer. But if that's how you're going to be thinking about things, you have to re reconsider the marriage, you know, in its entirety, because marriage is not a, uh, some people, they think marriage is like some kind of like business, uh, uh, you know, cooperative business. Marriage is supposed to be based on love and respect, not, not on, not on uh, you know, not on like a, a business contract. So, you know, if people are looking at marriage like that, you know, the marriage is really not going to survive. If there are irreconcilable differences between one's in-laws and the daughter-in-laws, does the husband have the right to force his wife to live with the in-laws who are abusing her? No, he doesn't have the right to. Uh, your parents are your parents, not your spouse's parents, as I've said before. My wife's parents are her parents, they're not my parents. I don't have, I don't have much obligation towards them, other, you know, more than I would have with a regular you know, Muslim, just to be respectful and, and kind and, and whatnot. Uh, oftentimes when in-laws get involved in the marriage, uh, marriages, uh, you know, either severely struggle or they collapse. Uh, we've seen this time and time and time and time again. You know, you can't force your spouse, you know, to 
love your your parents, their their in laws. <clears throat> it's not it's not going to work like that. So bring if there's already tension, you know, bringing your family into the picture. Uh, when there's already that tension, you, you're only asking for a, a disaster. You're only asking for something something bad to happen. Now maybe there's a circumstance where your in-laws or your parents have to visit or stay with you for a while and things like that. In which case, you know, I think if you establish some sort of parameters or some types of rules, um, then hopefully you can maintain that type of respect. If you bring your parents to your house and there's tensions between your parents and your wife, and your parents, you know, you need to also let your parents know that it's her house, right? It's your spouse, you know, you have a house together and maybe you, 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 you maybe you're the earner of, of the house, but inside the house, the woman is the one that's going to be in charge of those, of those affairs. So you can't overstep that. You can't overstep that for your wife. It's disrespectful to your wife. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, and you are, you're feeding that, you're feeding those flames of, of, of tension. Uh, and we are people that are, are meant to stay away from fitna. So <clears throat> you have to find ways to uh, maintain that type of order and, and everyone can respect the relationship. But you can't force your spouse, to, you know, to fall in love with your parents and, you know, to treat your parents like their own because they're not. They have their own parents. That would be, a, that would be abusive. Does the wife have the right to refuse to work or work from home rather than having a, to deal with other coworkers that might put her at risk of zina. Of course, if you're scared that working or, you know, first of all, a wife does not, a, a wife has no obligation to work as, as we know, uh, unless she wants to, or unless it's by mutual consent between the husband and the wife. But if the work environment is toxic, then you have the right to avoid that as the questioner asked. What are some du'as to strengthen our marriages, relationships during the pandemic? There is obviously a lot of stress put on families. With the lengthening of the situation and even through the COVID vaccine is out, a lot of trepidation remains since we cannot gather at the masjid in large groups as we used to. Our youth are also suffering since they might not have the normal social development skills uh, if they have to remain at home versus around their peers. What can we do to build Laban virtually until we return to our masjid? <clears throat> Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask, we ask Allah ta'ala to, to protect us and protect our families and, and, and to help us. Uh, you know, anything uh, that you need to ask, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, I do want to mention that I th you have to understand that our children are much more resilient than we think. Uh, we are much more resilient than we think. Uh, this has been, honestly, a very minor inconvenience in comparison to the type of challenges that people live with. Um, so while it is, has been a very, very strange 12 months, uh, I admit, uh, even now looking at pictures, you know, from last year before March, you know, January and February, or if you watch something on TV, like, oh my God, everyone is so close. They're, they're hugging, they're shaking hands, no one's wearing a mask, you know, you, you become agitated. It's been such a very strange, here, we're going to be okay, inshallah. Everything will be fine. Uh, we will, you know, slowly things will roll back and, and we'll be able to meet as, you know, as was mentioned in the question, we'll be at the masjid before we know it, all of that kind of stuff. But the question or the, or the key for us is, are we using this time for, for healthy activities or not? So this is, this is a wonderful time, uh, you know, throughout this, the, the COVID pandemic and, and the, the various lockdowns and all of that. It's a, it's a very a wonderful time for introspection. It's a wonderful time for spending more time with the family. It's a wonderful time to, you know, let's have meals. You know, many families are now able to have three meals with their, all of them as a family together. Whereas in the past, they'd be lucky if they could squeeze out one meal a day as a family. So you need to look at those opportunities Children, they need to feel love. They need to feel harmony uh, in the family. It's, it's very disruptive for them if they feel any type of tension. So it's also the attitude that we bring as adults. If we are upbeat, if we are happy, if we are optimistic, then inshallah that will, you know, that will influence our children. And if we are not, if it's the opposite, that will also influence our children. So inshallah, we're more resilient than we think. We're adaptive. We're an adaptive species. Allah Ta'ala has created us that way. Uh, so as we have adapted to this, inshallah, we will be fine. 
but we ask just turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him for his protection and increase I would say to increase our prayers and salutations on the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam as he is the source of all barakah can we please create avenues such as seekers guidance where male or female scholars can post questions anonymously and have their fiqh related issues solved I think the majority of the issues are surrounding Muslim marriage rights well that's what this forum is for for us if anybody has any questions that are fiqh related you know email the support at iccpmd.org email address all of these questions are anonymous um, some of these questions are fiqh related that we've answered so uh, my understanding is that this is what this forum forum is if, if somebody has something else in mind let us know when it comes to witter prayers if one wants to pray three rakats could we do two and one like maghrib yes some say you need to do two finish and then do one more to make it three if so what is this they're just different narrations so you can pray it like maghrib or you can pray two and then one uh, in the third rakah of witr salah is it okay to raise your hands to make dua after you recite dua and qunut? yes when you when you make dua in the witr you're going to make dua like this but you're not going to wipe your 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 face you make dua like this and then you just put your hands down Allahu Akbar and then you go to sujood is it permissible to change dua from singular to plural when reciting in a gathering yeah of course Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt you know, Allah guide all of us together Allahumma hadini Allah guide me singular plural is fine there's nothing wrong with that Alhamdulillah we donate to the masjid and Islamic institutions and charities throughout the year what are the opinions of scholars from the most strict to the most lenient about taking a tax deduction on our taxes to the federal or state level as a result of our donations? Would it not be considered as a backdoor way in getting more of that money back into our pockets and would lessen our overall donation? No, that's the, that's the financial and tax system that we have in this country. If you donate money to a, a, a charity, a 501c3 or any other type of charity that has a tax deductible status, you are allowed to claim those deductions or the, you are allowed to claim those donations up to a certain limit uh, for a tax deduction. And as a matter of fact, you know, America is one of the, the most philanthropic countries precisely, but this is one of the reasons why, because the system encourages you to give money because at the end of the day, it's gonna help you financially. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a way of encouraging people to, to donate. There's nothing wrong with, with taking that deduction. There's no, there's no opinion of the Sharia on that. That's fine. It's, you have to, you know, do your best to fill out your taxes as uh, accurately as possible. Obviously, we all have that obligation. And if you have donated money, then that's good for you. There's nothing wrong. Because think about what's going to happen is it's encouraging you to give money to the mosque, right? Many times uh, in mosque fundraisers, we, we don't do this because we, our fundraiser usually takes place in Ramadan. But many times when the mosque or any charity in America has an end of the year campaign. You know, why is there an end of the year campaign? Because they're encouraging people to give money before the calendar year ends for tax purposes. So they're appealing to their self-interest. So there's nothing wrong with that, inshallah. All actions are based on intentions and everyone gets what they intended. So you're going to get what you intended, inshallah. Is it acceptable to ask Allah Ta'ala to have patience with you while trying to abandon a sin? <laughs> Allah is not a person. This, this, this type of, of question, <laughs> this is one of the problems. Allah Ta'ala is not your best friend. Allah is, is your creator. Allah is Allah. Nothing is like Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Ask Allah Ta'ala for your forgiveness before you even say, Ya Allah, forgive, before you even utter those words, you will have been forgiven. Because Allah is Ghafoorun Rahim. Uh, we need to, we need, please go back and look at the 19 uh, videos in which we explain the 99 names of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Why did, why did we go through those names and attributes? What was the point of, one of the points of those classes is to, to remind us who Allah Ta'ala is. Um, when we say Laysa Kamithli Hishay, nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We dispel any notion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, has like feelings the way we have feelings. 
and he's just like a bigger person. We're a person, but Allah's like a mega person. No, that's 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 not what we say at all. <laughs> that's haram. That's that's uh, kuf. That's disbelief. Laysa kamithlihi shay. Nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa taala. Nothing is near Allah subhanahu wa taala. Nothing can approximate Allah subhanahu wa taala. But rather, we know about Allah taala through His divine attributes. Allahu qafurun rahim. Rahman Rahim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Allah minna ka'foon, tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anna. Allah, you are forgiving, you love to forgive, so forgive us. That is the dua the Prophet Sallallahu taught us uh, in Ramadan. So don't, you, you don't have to ask Allah Ta'ala for patience, you want to ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala for maghfirah, for, for forgiveness. Before you even finish asking Allah with that dua, before you even finish it, you have been forgiven. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that inspired you, who gave you that ability to say that dua, to ask, meaning that means he wants to give it to you. But I, but I know I'm going to finish that dua and I'm going to fall into sin again. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for maghfirah again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet taught us that the angels that record our bad deeds they wait six hours before recording the, the bad deed. So let's say I do something wrong. Uh, the angel that will write, the, the angel on, the, on your left that will write down that bad deed in your record will wait for six hours. The ulama understood that to actually be six hours, not like a metaphor, but to be exactly six human hours. So if it was noon and I, and I committed a sin, I have until 6 p.m. To do what? To make tawbah. What happens if I make tawbah? It won't even be written. You won't even, there will be no record of it. There will be no record of it for it to be expunged. It will not be written at all. Isn't Allah Ta'ala telling us? Isn't the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi showing us how merciful and how compassionate and forgiving Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is? So be quick to make tawbah. Don't wait. Oh Allah, be patient with me. You're like prolonging your, your torturing yourself. Don't do that. Make tawbah. But I'm going to fall into the sin again. Make tawbah again. Allahu ghafoorun rahim. There's nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't and will not forgive. We ask Allah ta'ala to forgive us all, inshallah. Is there only one correct way to wear the hijab? At times I feel like a man, a woman's hijab is never considered enough by some people's standards. How will I know mine is enough? The fact that you even asked this question tells me that what you're doing is enough. Uh, don't listen uh, to any men say that your hijab is not sufficient. Do not ask details about the hijab. This is one of the questions that my teachers would refuse to answer. And anytime a woman would come and ask, they would say, you know, this is exactly why Allah Ta'ala gave us the story of Al-Baqarah in Surah Al-Baqarah to remind us that we do not ask questions. You know, Inna Allah ya'murukum an baqarah. Allah commands you to, to you know, sacrifice a, a cow. You know, but the people of uh, Bani Israel, they said, okay, how big is the cow? How old is the cow? But we, we, we don't understand how, how they kept asking these questions because they did not want to commit the act. So we are not a people that are, are encouraged to continue asking questions, detailed questions about an act. You know, your, 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 your head uh, and, uh, you know, you, you're wearing the hijab Khalas, you're wearing the hijab. You know, don't you know? Don't don't keep uh, stressing about that. If you have a specific issue, you know, you can come and you can talk to me privately. Uh, if there's like something else that's like really, you know, you know, uh, bothering you. But you know, when somebody says uh, in the mosque, oh, "Oh, sister," you know, don't just don't just ignore those phrases. And I and I, when I grew up, I used to I, I learned to ignore. Oh, brother. Brother, brother, I need to point something out to you. Th that for me is like a, a reaction of like in one ear, out the other. You know, when they, that, oh, brother, brother, I have to tell you, 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 you know, your prayer. And, uh, you, you know, we're always meeting in this forum. So you always, you know, for the last almost five, six years, you guys see me in this, you know, capacity. But, you know, I'm, I'm just a normal person, just like everyone else. So sometimes I'm civilian and I just go to the mosque and I just want to pray and things like that. So <laughs> those, those statements, uh, brother, brother, I need to point something out to you. Just sister, sister, you know, your prayer was not valid. Just, okay. Just say, when someone says that, say, go talk to Tariq. Go talk to the imam uh, and he'll sort it out. 
because it becomes ridiculous. It becomes ridiculous. And and why are men so obsessed with women's hijab? I, I don't understand. I really don't understand. I don't understand. I mean, I'm not obsessed with it, but it's something that we learned about because it's part of Islamic law and it's you know something that I have to be able to answer and stuff like that. But just like I learned about, you know, you know, sorry to be graphic, but I had to learn about a women's monthly cycle and I have to learn about you know childbirth and because these are questions that come up. So I had to learn about these things. But you know, there are some, you know, it's like some people they 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 want to make the hijab the, the be all and end all of all issues. Um, so that's also not normal. That's also there's something not there's something weird and not natural about that. So you wear the hijab because you know it's an obligation. Alhamdulillah, kudos to you. You're my hero. Uh, it's very hard. I totally respect you. I'm totally supportive of you. Uh, and mastata'atum. Allah says, you know, worship Allah, comply with Allah as much as you can. One time Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he was walking with his companions when he was the Khalifa. And... Uh, Somebody from a second, you know, story uh, window or balcony. Uh, I, maybe they were cleaning their, you know, space, their living space, and they just, you know, chucked out some water into the street. So some of the water uh, came on on them. So the man next to Sayyidina Omar, you know, he looked at his clothes and he looked at the and he looked up and he said, you know, I ask you by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, is this water pure? And Sayyidina Omar. <laughs> He said, I ask you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to answer this man. You know, he said, that's not how we learn. That's, Sayyidina Umar is teaching us, that's not how we learn from the Prophet It's water. What's the natural state of water? He said, it's pure. Khalas, why do you have to start thinking that the water is impure and now you have to go home and change your clothes and things like that? Because if that person answered and said, oh, the water is impure, all of them would have had to go home and change. But rather, we are meant to take things simply. You wear the hijab, khalas. Don't worry about it. Don't keep asking those details. Just keep going forward, inshallah. This is a lesson for all of us, inshallah. We need to support our women, not, not, not abuse them, you know, emotionally and all the time. Where was I? Okay. During salah, when we sit and we say, Allahumma baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad, how is baraka to the Prophet, alayhi salam, when he is in his current non-living state? compared to the barakah for us living in this world. Well, that's the, the error is in the question. Who said that the Prophet ﷺ is not in his living state? Allah, the Prophet ﷺ is hadir nadir. The Prophet ﷺ is alive and present. Assalamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi. This is kaf al-mukhatab. This is the kaf that you use to address somebody. Assalamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullah. You are directly addressing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet did not pass, is not dead, but the Prophet passed to Rafiq al Ala. We do not say that he is dead. Uh, and death is not the end of life, as I always remind you and remind myself that death is moving from one mode of living to another. So the, there is no non living state, and the dead are dead. And no, no, that's, that's not the way of Islam at all. The, the dead hear us, they benefit from our dua towards them. Uh, on top of all of that is Rasulullah. Every time you say, uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad uh, and you ask Allah Ta'ala for his prayers and salutations on the Prophet Sassam, he, the Prophet Sassam prays on you imagine that every time you say Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad he is giving salat on you he is praying for you Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam what are some of the uh, ways to help get into a state of khushua and focus during the salah well I just realized now with, with this question that I forgot to make my video about the prayer. So I'll try to get that out before the next uh, Ask Tariq session. But the way I told you guys about prayer, about making the prayer one long uninterrupted sentence, such that there is no moment of silence in the prayer, the way that Imam al-Ghazali described, this is the greatest way that I know of to, to have khushua. The other thing is uh, which requires, by the way, that you learn some of the, a, a couple of sunnah du'as. That's also, I should mention that, that's also important. So if you make, if you make the effort to learn some of the sunnah du'as, like the du'a that you say right when you say Allahu Akbar before you begin the recitation, uh, the du'a that you say in between the two uh, uh, sajdas, um, if you learn those, you'll know, you'll, you will have no silent moment. That will help you focus. Also, not making the prayer last too long. 
if you're if you you know if you if you're praying and you know your prayer lasts too long sometimes your mind wanders but only doing what needs to be done in the prayer to give it its full right not to you know to to cruise by it but to, to give it its full right but no more that's one of the ways so I, I i remember now and i will make i made a note i will inshallah make that video since we are in lockdown i really enjoy doing a lot of nephil fast so can you fast on a friday if you have fasted thursday yes there's no prohibition against fasting on a friday and on an individual day uh, if it's if your intention is that it's a sunnah or or a saturday or a sunday that's fine uh what are some of the resources for dhikr? Resources for dhikr, you can read the book of supplication in Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya. Uh, you should find it translated. I don't know what book number it is, but I think it's called the book of supplication or the book of dhikr. Read what Imam al-Ghazali has to say about dhikr. Uh, resources about dhikr. Dhikr is going to be discussed in the, book, in the books of tasawwuf. So the books of Tasawwuf are dedicated, the science and the discipline of Tasawwuf is dedicated to explaining what dhikr is and how dhikr is to be done and, and all, all that kind of stuff. So start with Imam al-Ghazali. Uh, you also have uh, Imam al-Qushayri's Risal al-Qushayriya, radiallahu anhu, which is the, you know, the umda, the, 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 the first and the most important book of this discipline. What else do we have in English? <clears throat> I think there are some of the books of Sidi Abdul Qadir al Jilani, radiallahu uh, anhu, have been translated. You know, these are the type of authors of the type of books that you should go to to understand how dhikr is done. You know, uh, what what's it all about? What does it accomplish? Okay, and then the final question. Well, we've gone for quite a long time. Okay, the final question: What do the following mean? Wird fikr. Qira'a, tariqa. Okay, wird is, is, is something that you do at the same time every day. So I have a wird in my Qur'an. I, I read a page in my Qur'an, you know, every day after Fajr prayer, for example. You call this a wird, something that, a litany, something that you do constantly. When people say that they have a wird, usually what they mean is that they have a allotted uh, dhikr or Quran recitation that they do every day at a certain amount of time <clears throat> and the wird uh, as, as a form of dhikr is one of the most important tools uh, that we have in our worship in, in our path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fikr, fikr is contemplation the people that remember Allah standing, sitting, and lying down and contemplate. They contemplate the heavens and the earth. So fikr is, to, is contemplation. It's to sit down, to think about things, to tie things together, uh, to take some time and just you know, sit there and, and ponder and ask yourself questions and try to answer them and it's about thinking. Qira'a is recitation. So you can read the Qur'an or you can read your wird. Or you could read a book. Qira'a is reading. And tariqa, a tariqa is, means path. Uh, and in the, in the language of Islam, the word tariqa usually refers to a spiritual path. And we liken our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a path. Uh, so the tariqa is evolves throughout Islamic history as an organized way of organizing your spiritual devotion and spiritual uh, practice to arrive at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, you have a teacher, you have a sheikh that guides you uh, down that path and helps you, you know, helps you become the best version of yourself. So in the, in the usage of Islam, that, that's what the word means, path, but in its usage in Islam, it refers to the spiritual path. Allahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Let me see if anything came in the chat. <clears throat> well, there are some questions in the chat. Please make du'a maghfirat for the brother-in-law of one of our Famous community member, Sister Lina, Brother Atif Abdul Fatah, who passed away in England with COVID last week. We ask Allah Ta'ala, ta inshallah, for shifa for them, Ya Rabbi. 
do we have to follow tajweed when reciting the Quran? As much as we can to, to learn the proper, uh, the proper way of reading the Quran, as much as we can. We should do that as much as we can. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I heard you saying we could combine the prayers so that we do not miss it. Can we do this regardless if we are traveling or having any difficulty praying? For example, if we are at the office, could you please clarify? I think I lo I'm lost. Appreciate your advice. Yes, that's what I said. You can combine your prayers even if you're not traveling. You can't shorten your prayers. Shortening your prayers is only a function of travel. You can combine your prayers, Zuhra uh, and Asr together and Maghrib and Aisha together without traveling. So you're at work and, you know, or you're at school or for no reason. The hadith in, in Muslim is narrated by Ibn Abbas is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam combined his prayers in Medina for no reason. So the Shafi'is took from this hadith and they, they, they use this hadith in their legal structure to say that it is permissible. Is there a ruling in the Shafi'i school that your wudu is gone if you shake hands or touch adult person of another gender unless the person is a parent or sibling. Yes, in the Shafi'i Madhab, that is, that is the case. Uh, that if you come into skin contact with somebody who is not your mihram, uh, you lose your wudu. That is the Shafi'i position. I know for the Hanafis, qunut is obligatory in witr. Is it the same in the other madhabs? I heard for the Malikis, it's makruh to do qunut and witr, but I would like to confirm. Uh, it's not obligatory in the other madhabs. It's a sunnah uh, in the Shafi'i madhab to do a qunut in witr starting from the night of the 15th of Ramadan till the end of the month. Is it haram living with a Christian? I don't understand the question. Like as like a roommate or something like that? Uh, there's nothing haram with that. I could not fast for the entire month of Ramadan due to my pregnancy, so I have to make up the entire month even though I feed people who are fasting. Uh, yes, if you, because the pregnancy is uh, a temporary, obviously a temporary situation. Uh, so you, yeah, you're going to have to, you'll make up the fast, inshallah. When you make dua, is it okay to do it in English or is it better to do it in Arabic? Where can we learn specific duas in Arabic? Yes, of course, it's okay to do it in any language. Allah Ta'ala will understand, of course. Alhamdulillah. Uh, where can you learn the dua? Uh, Imam al-Nawawi's book, Kitab al-Adhkar, uh, the book of remembrance, is, is one of the greatest books for that. And uh, it's, it's translated into English as the book of remembrance. And the reason I like that translation, even though I know it's a little expensive, that book, that particular book, is that all of the duas are in Arabic, transliteration and translation uh, so the book of the kitab al adhkar is is a book that every muslim household should have it's one of those books that you, it has a dua, a dua for everything you know um, if you're sick visiting a sick person you know dua for your children dua for your parents dua for someone who's passed away dua before you eat dua when you wake up dua when you sleep dua when you put on clothes it does a dua for everything <clears throat> so that's, that's really the greatest resource uh, that you have. Uh, and Imam al uh, you know, Allah have mercy and bless him, you know, infinitely on our behalf for all what he did for this ummah. Uh, he is a, a scholar of the highest caliber. So he, you know, he also in the book, the book is also a book of hadith. So the reason scholars are interested in that book is that we, we also learn the verification of hadith and, and how hadith are compiled and and whatnot. So he, he always uses the reliable hadith to, to provide you with the, with the du'a. Uh, that's the greatest book. So if, if people want to learn du'a, you, you should get that book and you should, you know, you can look up anything. It's like an, it's even though it's one book, it's like really like an encyclopedia because anytime you have to look up something, you have it. So that's what I would advise. Okay. I'm assuming there are no more questions. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. One is a reminder that for the, the Q&A session that, will, that takes place the first Tuesday of every month, you can email the questions to support 
at iccpmd.org. Uh, the second thing I wanna say is I wanna remind everyone that all of these questions are anonymous. So I do not know who asked these questions. And I just want people to, you know, sometimes I'm colorful when I read the questions. And I just want people to understand that that's just my natural reaction. <laughs> I don't know who's asked these, nor do I really want to know who asked them. So Brother Muslim asking me to give you guys the link for the Book of Remembrance. Why are all these Christian books of remembrance coming up? So give me a second here. Oh, here it is. Send to everybody. I hope that worked. Okay. Um, or where was I? Oh yeah, so the question, all of this is anonymous. Uh, if you've asked a question and, uh, you know, I didn't answer what you wanted or, you know, you have more questions, you know, please do follow up either with me directly or, you know, for the next time, inshallah, the, the point of this is to, to, for me to help as much as possible, help you clarify these questions. So uh, Sometimes I answer the questions thinking that I've answered the question or I've you know, lived up to the obligation, but then you, you're like, no, that's not what I meant or I didn't understand, which, which happens. And if that's the case, I do apologize, but please do follow up. Uh, inshallah, you know, we're, we're gonna do this at least two more times, I think before Ramadan, if I'm not mistaken. So we have, we have more than ample time, inshallah. Uh, other thing I do wanna remind everyone of is uh, you know, there were a couple of questions about community and, you know, staying connected and ICCP for us is our connection. It, this is our family. Uh, so I, I do want to remind everyone to, to make an effort to support the mosque, inshallah, uh, as we get start thinking about Ramadan right, right around the corner, just a little over two months, uh, we will be coming back to the community with, you know, with our, with our ask, but, you know, please do remember the importance of, of supporting the masjid, inshallah. With that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, wait, there's another question. Can I pray in the car if I'm outside and I'm afraid to miss the time of salah? No, because if you are physically able to stand, uh, then you have to stand. So you, can't, you can only pray sitting if you are unable to stand. And that's why the solution to this problem is to combine the prayers. That's how you get out of that problem. So that way you won't have to worry about, uh, about praying in the car, not in the car, and all of that kind of stuff. So you have to pray standing if you're physically able to. If you think that you're going to miss the prayer, then you can delay the prayer. To, you know, if it's Dhuhr, you can delay it to Al Asr. And you can start planning your day around that, inshallah. So I ask Allah Ta'ala to bless us all, inshallah, to protect us, to have mercy on our parents, to protect and bless our children, inshallah. I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to give us the light of faith in our hearts, inshallah, to protect us, to make us people of the Quran and make us people of the Sunnah, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli afdala salatin ala as'adi makhluqatika sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim adada ma'lumatika wa midada kalimatika kullama dhakaraka dhakiruna wa ghafala an dhikrihi al-ghafilun